Hello, my name is Melissa Daniels, and this is Strabismus to Stereopsis. This week, we are going to talk all about exotropia and some new ways that are being used to help people gain better control with exotropia to keep their eyes straight and working together. And a lot of this is coming from some research done by a fabulous doctor named Dr. David Cook. Before jumping into exotropia, be sure to go over to learn.strabismussolutions.com. Over there, you can get a lot of different resources that I offer. You can sign up for a Zoom call, you can take the Mastering Peripheral course, and a whole lot of other things. In Dr. Cook's study, a treatise on redefining success in optometric vision therapy for strabismus, we need to define who we're talking about. So um, he has a section on esotropia and a section on exotropia. And with the exotropia, it is a more select group because there's so many like, well, it's kind of exotropia, but plus this or that. Like there's a lot of complicating factors. And so he only took patients that fit into like one group and that would be that they are greater than five years old, they have the ability to align their eyes even 1% of the time, like on a specific test with like maybe the stereo fly, they can align their eyes and see it float maybe, but but not any other time. So even if it's like 1% of the time, they have ability to kind of bring those eyes in, even if it's not necessarily even that they have that control. So he calls them intermittent exotropes, but he uses that term really loosely. It's not like half and half. Um, definitely no post-surgical. So Anyone who's had strabismus surgery is definitely not allowed to be in the exotropia group. There were some in the esotropia group, but none for the exos. It's because once you throw in surgery, they that's usually more of an eso thing anyway. So these are people who have exotropia. Their ages, I think, five to fifty-five, and yeah, no previous surgery. So you know, as adults, you might not. Um, relate to this as much if you've had like we're like me I had exotropia when the eye goes out I had that most of my life but I really started out with esotropia and then after surgeries it became exotropia so it's not about those people just to be clear because this protocol that he uses for his exotropia patients would not work on a post-surgery at ex exotropia it's a totally different ball game so this is for people who haven't had surgery yet First, let's look at what Dr. Cook considers a success for exotropia. Um, behavioral success for him with strabismus is less than eight diopters of, e, um, of an angle of eye turn, and they're able to have like good depth perception, like that awareness of space where you are in comparison to the world. And with exotropia, because they usually are able to get great stereopsis and great numbers there, his focus is more on control, that they're able to keep their eyes straight even when you're doing like the cover test where usually things fall apart. So um, that's a big part of the focus and just being able to control and during those tests, even without something to look at, they can still keep their eyes straight and aligned without a target. So in the paper, it's funny, he had, for esotropy, he has like steps one through seven, protocol for esotropia, like very clearly defined. And then you go to the exotropia section and it's much more muddled. Like I had to go through and read it and he's got things numbered here and then numbered there. And I'm like, okay, this one didn't quite, it wasn't quite as clear. So I tried to, I read through it like 10 times and tried to really come, okay, what are his key things that he's working on with these patients? What is the protocol that he's following? So I did take a few liberties. If you read the article and you're like, this doesn't, I don't see this anywhere. That's because there's a few sections on titled protocol and I got, I, I picked out five things out of there. So number one, same as esotropia, you got to get those eyes moving, have that flexibility and control. It's not so much about, do we have a restriction with our movement, but can we feel that control? So it's controlling where the eye is. And so sometimes you do it super close so that you can feel that muscle and learn how to feel your muscles moving through space. So this is with eyes open, eyes closed. Um, that's a big deal with exotropia. Number two, like I said before, you um, everyone in the study was at least able to pop the eye in in order, you know, for a specific test or something where there there was some sort of alignment and um, using the eye fusion possible. Um, and so that's a big part in the beginning is 
getting to the point where you can maximize ranges. So you can converge really far, diverge really far, you know, look far and near and get those eyes moving. This usually comes really quick, um, getting better stereo. You know, stereo is measured in arc seconds and some of these people started with like 400, 500, 600 arc seconds. I don't even know if those are actual numbers, but you know, that's the idea. And they got down to like 40. And they get, that happens pretty quickly with exotropia. That's kind of the easy part. It's like, oh yeah, I can do this all day long. I can converge and diverge and I have great stereo. Um, the problem is that then as soon as they walk away from you, their eye just goes out. And this is something that he talked a lot about when I got to see him present this live. And, you know, he does it in a pretty funny way. He's like, oh yeah, they can sit in your chair and they can pass every test in the world. But then they get out of the chair and walk out of your room and they let their eye go again. And that's just because it's like their normal is to have that eye out. And so a huge part of it is learning to just have that be automatic to keep the eyes straight. And so that's more where the focus is. So the third thing is he focuses a lot on voluntary control. So basically you're think of it like you have a Brock string and you're moving your eye from bead to bead and your eyes are changing, but doing that without the Brock string. <laughs> Right? Can you do that without the string? Or can you have the Brock string and, or, you know, I'm going to use a different version. Okay, so let's say we have this target. This is, you can see it floating right here if you're wearing the special glasses. Um, this is a stereo target. And he will cover the eye until the person has their eye go out. Okay, that's the cover test is going to maybe make the eye pop out or maybe the patient has the control to do that. And so then they're going to lose the depth. It's going to go flat because now they're only using one eye and then uncover it. And can they pop it back out? Right. So can you control that? Can you bring it in? Um, can you there's, you know, crossing your eyes and getting like a stereo pair where you've got two pictures that match and you have to do some free fusion in free space. So a lot of stuff where you are having to have this voluntary control. There's no special glasses. There's no VR headset that's like helping do all the work. You have to actually do that work with your eyes on your own without a lot of help. Um, he talks about you start with a stereo target like that vectogram and then you slowly move towards things that are like more difficult. So one would be like a simultaneous perception. Um, yeah, it's so hard. There's like a million exercises. It's, I guess I'm gonna have to do like 30 video series because some of the stuff isn't gonna make sense. But the idea is, I'm trying to think of something that most people would know. Like if you cover, cover one eye with a mirror, I know I've done this. If you go back and watch my mirror exercises. Um, I can hold this mirror right here and I see a painting. There's a painting over to my right, okay? And with my left eye, I can see my camera and I can actually, by moving this, this mirror, I can make it look like that camera is in the, like the paintings in front of me and the camera's right in the middle of that painting. Um, so I've got two, my eyes are each seeing something different and I can put them together like that simultaneous perception. So that's one form of that. There's a lot of different ways of doing this um, with the aperture rule, different things like that. But that's a big part of it is can you do that voluntary? And then he sits there and breaks fusion over and over again. He covers the eye, makes it so they can't fuse anymore, and then they have to recover. It's constantly about that recovery. Um, so then again, you're doing these same activities. You're getting fusion and you're locking it in and then add in balance, add in... Um, like rhythm, something with something with a metronome, adding in a cognitive test like math games or word games, anything that you're challenging the brain while you're keeping your eyes straight. There's some other ones they do with prism where they actually put prisms, really thick prisms in opposite directions. So it makes, so if you're looking at a chart, it actually makes it look like there's two exactly on top of each other and they'll look like they're sliding apart and you have to keep them exactly lined up in the middle and like read the chart. Um, it's so cool, it's so cool. But you, you have to have, that's one that you would only obviously do in office. But so there's just so much like that where you're not necessarily using like the 
3D TV as much. You're not using like all of those things because yeah, when given the 3D glasses, given the VR headset, it's like, yeah, we can, we can diverge all day. We can converge. We can get huge numbers and have amazing success. But then as soon as you get into real space where it doesn't have that, you just lose it. So that's a big part. Um, and then yeah, adding on all the, the fun mind body. And then the last thing, and he kind of, kind of, this is like his whole sec. So all those four things were in the first section. And then the second half is central and peripheral integration. And this is huge. Most people with exotropia can do something really central. Like if, if they need to use both eyes to read, they can, they can get their eyes both aligned and read. But when that happens, they're not aware of anything peripheral or they can be playing a sport and be super aware of the periphery, but like have no idea about any details, right? having the detail and the periphery at the same time is a challenge. And that is a huge part is integrating those two together so that you're using your central vision and your peripheral vision at the same time. And that's a big part of the, of the protocol. There are a million different activities that fall into this, maybe reading a chart while tapping post-it notes in the periphery, or you're looking at a 3D target with your central vision and sword fighting someone peripheral. Like there's so many things, but the idea is you're doing both at the same time and fluidly using your eyes for that. The reason this is so important is that tells your brain where to point your eyes when you know where you're trying to focus your eyes and you've got all that peripheral information, it gives your brain so much more information about where to point those eyes. Dr. Cook focuses on getting the patient to have that internal control, and they call it the internal locus of control, like they are controlling their eyes, they can move them where they want them to go. That is his main focus, and then he has these, those are all the ways that he does it, and when he uses those principles and he follows that protocol, the results are pretty amazing. Um, the average eye turn went from the angle of 25 to four. And if you take out and just do like the, instead of like the mean, you do the median, which takes out outliers. Um, it goes, the average went from 26. I think it went from 26 to zero. So most people ended their vision therapy with zero diopters of turn. And that is when you're doing the alternate cover test with no target, which you don't have to know. Basically, like they're making it really, really difficult for that patient um, to keep those eyes aligned. And so that just shows like so much control. Um, out of all of his patients, 83% achieved stereo vision, which was 40 seconds of arc or better. Um, sorry, 40 arc seconds or better. That is good enough to fly a jet in the military, right? That's what you need. So they, 83% were there, which is just amazing to me. It's really phenomenal. Um, and then 96% were considered a behavioral success. So the eye turn was less than eight diopters and they had, you know, the stereo fly and more. <laughs> so what can you do with all this information? I know it's a lot. And there are a billion exercises that can accomplish any of these. A lot of people say, hey, what's the exercise I should do to fix exotropia? What's the exercise I should do to fix esotropia? And the thing is, it's, it's so big. <laughs> There's so many different ones. And knowing which one to use and in what order and in how to present that, that's where the art comes in. And that's why it is so powerful to actually go to a vision therapy office and do this with them. Find someone who is a Dr. Cook fan. You know, say like, hey, have you read this research? What do you think of it? Do you think he's crazy or brilliant? And find the one that thinks he's brilliant and go to that office. That can help shape your vision therapy. And then as a patient, understanding that it's not about reading the letters on the chart and reading them really, really fast. That doesn't matter at all. It's about can you control your eyes? Can you see the space between you and the chart and the space in the room like and read at the same time? Can can you do this while standing on one foot and maintain alignment? Can you hold a finger here and have double and look at the chart and keep that single? Like that's the focus. It's not necessarily the activity. There's not just one activity that's going to be the, the magical cure to anything. It's more about who you're doing it with and how you are approaching it. Thank you for joining me today. If you have questions, please leave them in the comments below. I know that there was a lot of information in this extremely long video, but thank you for sticking around and we will see you in the next video.